Okay, so one thing I want you guys to understand is that this is not meant to be a replacement for this. You see, Apple has created a more compact laptop for the pros. The people that truly need the power for apps such as Cinema 4D, Xcode, Logic Pro, and even Premiere. Simply cause this is even a laptop you can spec with an M1 Max chip along 64 gigabytes of RAM. Unlike the 13 inch which tops out at 16 gigabytes. To put things into perspective, the goal today is to compare a base model MacBook Air and put it against this upgraded 14 inch MacBook Pro so we can truly see if more money means more power for your personal use. I hope today I can save you some money and a few headaches along your ownership. For starters, the chassis on the new laptop is a lot more robust, thicker to be able to pack awesome features like these new ports and practical with these function keys to get the job done. And these are all things that the MacBook Air doesn't have. As a result, we have a price difference of $1,200. But of course, that's not the full story. As consumers, we start second guessing ourselves and wondering if that amount of money is worth it. So the noticeable differences are pretty obvious. We've got a very different chassis where the air is thinner in every aspect and has a lot more sharp edges, but they are both almost around the same height, even though they sit on different design feet. The aluminum on the N1 Pro does feel different and the overall carry of this laptop feels a tad more premium. I'm not quite sure if it's because of the fact that it is one centimeter longer and wider or because it weighs 0.7 pounds more. Just keep in mind, the 14 inch is thicker, especially towards the air's tapered edge. Regardless, they are both extremely easy to pack up into a backpack with the air being lighter and they both take almost the exact same amount of room, to the point that the 14 inch fits in one of my moth 13 inch sleeves. Although because the 14 inch does feel more robust, I am a bit less scared when it comes to throwing it in a bag with a few accessories. So when traveling, these accessories are not so needed since the variety in ports make a big difference. Just cause we have an extra USB-C port with all of them being Thunderbolt 4, MagSafe to prevent your cable from pulling the laptop, an HDMI 2.0 port, and the SDXC card slot. Which is why I believe they removed the tapered design the MacBook Air has. On top of that, it's important to know that with this 14 inch, you can natively rock dual displays unlike the Air. So there's no need to buy a pluggable dual 4K display dock. And do keep in mind that the Air is completely sealed since it is completely fanless in contrast to the 14 inch. Both laptops can be easily opened with one hand, with the hinges finally feeling the same providing an identical maximum viewing angle. And as you can see inside, we've got a few key differences. 14.2 inches versus 13.3 inches, different pixel counts, with a 26 pixel per inch difference, and even 500 nits going against 400 nits on the air which is very noticeable, especially outdoors. Even different viewing angles are a lot better on the new Pro, but this mini LED liquid retina XDR display isn't as perfect as it seems, simply because it blooms a lot mostly when you're looking at it from an angle, which is something I discovered while using the 16 inch at night. Although because it has a mini LED screen, unlike the single backlit panel from the air, consuming content and watching movies in the dark is better on the Pro. Look, compared to the IPS Retina display the M1 has, the 14 inch screen is a lot brighter, has better contrast, is sharper, delivers a better dynamic range and offers promotion. Which means that on the air, we get to consume content at a log 60 hertz no matter what. On the other hand, the 14 inch adapts to our content consumption and can go up to 120 hertz if we are playing games such as Counter Strike and go to as little as 24 frames per second when watching movies which then allows the battery to conserve energy without harming the user experience by choosing the right frame rate within that range. This does bring me to the fact that it now supports HDR content and you can clearly see the difference between both these laptops where the 14 inch tops out at 1600 nits. Personally, it's not a reason to get the 14 inch simply because the MacBook M1 screen was already quite good and color accurate. However, the thin bezels with rounder corner edges and the notch might be hard to resist. Even though both displays start around the same height, the bezel difference is big and the fact that we get a notch adds to that immersive experience. While working, I do feel like I'm getting sucked into my screen because to be honest, the notch is just not that noticeable. The menu bar in most apps wraps around it well, the mouse goes right under when traveling through that area and when consuming content, it disappears due to the 16 by 10 aspect ratio of the screen. Overall, from the get-go, I've always found this super awesome because there's less wasted space. And I know what you're thinking, why didn't Apple make the top bezel like on the XPS 13? Well, to be honest, I think it's because they wanted to fit a 1080p camera on this 14-inch. 
which obviously is super different from what we're getting on the M1 MacBook Air. On top of that, the colors actually look great. The image noise the sensor produces is a lot less prominent and it is a lot sharper. However, for the price, it would have been super nice having Face ID as well as center stage. But I have to admit, for $2,500 Canadian, these six speakers with high fidelity sound do sound so much better. So much bass. Moving down, the keyboard and trackpad are both different. We do get a matte black color scheme for the M1 Pro as well as some bigger function keys compared to the M1 keyboard. And it's nice to see Apple taking advantage of their newly created space and making the Touch ID bigger this time. I love it just because I did find myself missing it on the 13 inch quite often. Other than that, the keys and travel feel the same. As for the trackpad, there is a noticeable difference with the fact that the haptic feedback on the Force Touch feels and sounds distinct. And in terms of size, Apple did go with a larger trackpad for the 14 inch, which is nice because I do feel like I'm running out of runway when I drag and drop on smaller trackpads. Although in this case, I still think the trackpad size within the air is perfect. Overall, the trackpad allows me to do simple things like browsing the net, doing dev work, some spreadsheet work, and simply using it as a day-to-day -day device. Look, the M1 Air can handle a great amount of processing tasks. In fact, to put things into perspective, I ran a few web browser benchmarks to compare with the 14-inch. And no matter what you end up doing on the web, most web apps like, for example, Notion will do just fine. So running Jetstream 2 to test advanced web applications, we did get results of 177 for the Air and 194 for the 14-inch Pro. With Speedometer, which measures the responsiveness of web applications, we did get results of 233 for the Air and 234 for the 14 inch pro and motion mark which is a graphics benchmark that measures a browser's capability to animate complex scenes we did get results of 596 for the air and 293 for the new pro truthfully guys for general use i just don't see why i would ever spend a thousand two hundred dollars more when we see great performance on the m1 air i mean even launching excel takes relatively the same amount of time which is why I decided to download a fairly large sales spreadsheet to compare both of these laptops. Note, Office apps now run natively, and as you can see moving around, manipulating and performing general UI usage is very similar on both laptops. Overall, going around this sheet is just very crispy and still delivers a super quick user experience. And so when it comes to converting a million rows to a table and trying to add some numbers to generate a new column for it, it does it really easily. But when performing a sort on a million rows, like for example, an ascending sort, they both take a large amount of time to the point that you will be waiting a while. Another example is VLOOKUP, and within a table so large, it doesn't seem to struggle in any of these machines. Regardless, both keyboards are very similar. So when it comes to using Excel shortcuts like Shift F3 to take a look at your formula builder, it's important to note you need to use the FN key to use the function keys. The only thing I would say is that it's critical to remember that if you come from a PC, the VBA integration and pivot tools lack on Apple's side. In any case, please do note that with such heavy files, as you work on Excel, both machines can feel a bit slow while performing operations. Anyhow, when it comes to working with heavy files, having a 2500 megabit per second difference in terms of SSD speeds will help, but it's something that only the pro people will notice. So if you need to jump into projects such as Xcode, you will notice files loading a lot quicker. And essentially, with good RAM and fast SSD speeds, Xcode will genuinely perform well in terms of UI interaction on both machines. Although, things are very much noticeable when benchmarking Xcode, so if I wanted to measure compilation times with both these devices, I simply cloned the repo for the benchmark and I ran the sh benchmark.sh command within both terminals. The impressive thing is that the temperatures during the build were not too far apart considering the air is fanless. Although, as expected, we did get way better results on the Pro in terms of compilation time and note that the RAM here wasn't playing a big role during the test. One thing I want to show you guys is that by running the same project on both machines, the project does take a bit more time to build and open on the MacBook Air. Regardless, when I was writing code and changing tabs back and forth, I never seemed to encounter lag with any of these machines, even on a fairly big project such as WebKit. 
Look, if you like to learn how to code to eventually make big projects like so, I suggest you check out Coding Dojo. Coding Dojo is a global technology education company that offers three full stack coding bootcamps. Whether you want to learn the leading industry Python tools, their full Java stack to eventually work in things such as server apps, at the financial services, or even learn Mern to create awesome e-commerce websites, Coding Dojo can allow you to maximize your career opportunities and have the chance to dive deep into software development, data science, and even cybersecurity. The curriculum is very well designed to make this your first and last bootcamp you'll ever attend, so you can start tackling projects and truthfully learn even more by doing. If it's of interest to you, you can download their course packet in the description and check out exactly what you will be learning. I personally have used their online platform to get back into iOS development, and I love how they deliver hands-on and structured teaching, which helps develop coding skills a lot quicker. I am more of a hands-on person, and so being able to have such an interactive platform accessible at all times is such a great way to really dive into the industry. But don't worry, if you can't attend their classes full-time, you also have the ability to do it part-time if it's a career change you're thinking of. Plus, after graduation, Coding Dojo ensures they are always there for you by being able to reach out to your career service managers again to reorient you and find the most suitable career in the industry. Look, I've learned by doing projects and I've eventually realized you also need the proper guidance to grow into self-sufficiency so you can become a good developer. So no matter which laptop you end up choosing, I think both will serve you well so you can start your development career and learn awesome tools such as Python. And yes, Python on both machines runs so well. In fact, I installed Anaconda to run natively and installed some of the packages required for our autoencoder to run in our virtual environment using both machines simply because I wanted to see how quick it would take for these laptops to use the artificial neural network to decompress and compress the input data provided in an unsupervised manner. Surprisingly, the air was fast within this benchmark, but I'm sure as we get into more complex projects, the M1 Pro will outpace the air. Although, to give you a bit more of an accurate test comparison, I love running the Mandelbrot algorithm to stress test the CPU using Python. With surface temperatures of around 38 degrees on the Pro and 31 degrees on the Air, the heat around the keyboard made sense since we were seeing CPU sensor temperatures of around 96 degrees for the MacBook Air and 100 degrees for the Pro. And in terms of how much the resources were being utilized, well, the difference wasn't too drastic. But we did get final compilation times of 1 minute and 7 seconds for the Air and 35 seconds for the Pro. Regardless, it's just super fun seeing that the Air is able to keep up with these type of projects. And don't worry, on a full screen you can see that the difference between the 13 inch and 14 inch in a code editor is not that noticeable. You basically lose around 10 characters of horizontal space and around 2 lines of vertical space. It's just something that in my opinion isn't a big deal at all. Now, obviously, the fact that we are running 4 efficiency cores and 4 performance cores on the Air plays a big role, mainly because on my 14 inch I have 8 performance cores and 2 efficiency cores within the CPU. So in Geekbench, the CPU results were quite far apart in terms of multi-core performance. On the other hand, with similar results for the single core performance, it really shows why for development the results aren't so different. Meanwhile, on the GPU side of things using Metal, we got scores of 16,430. 37 for the M1 and scores of 37,650 for the Pro. I've personally seen huge improvements on the newer model, which is why for video editing, graphic design, and even motion graphics, I would pick the 14 inch any day. And these results are why I decided to run the 3D Mark Wildlife benchmark so I could compare the gaming performance within both devices. With the fanless MacBook, we got frame rates of 26, whereas with the Pro model, we got frame rates of about 62. And this clearly shows that we get more than double the performance in terms of graphics with the new model. Now, as we know, the Air is of course fanless, which is why I needed Cinebench to do a thermal throttle test. With CPU clock speeds of around 2000 MHz for each core on the Air, we knew the machine needed to lower its clock speeds due to thermal throttling, which of course did not happen on the M1 Pro since the fans did eventually cool down the system. And overall, it explains the performance difference between both these machines while performing this test. Now, I started doing all of our tests with a battery life of 95% on both machines at around 10 a.m. And now that it's 3 o'clock and we've gone through all these tests, we see battery lives of 34% for the MacBook Air and 14% for the MacBook Pro. 
which clearly shows the longevity both these laptops deliver in terms of battery life. I've personally experienced a much longer battery life on the Air and so for me it's almost like I should consider the MacBook Air more. Although to be honest, nothing beats MagSafe when it works as it should. I did run a few more tests and MagSafe does work like a charm depending on the way it pulls. It just doesn't do so well when pulling this way. They both come with a 67 watt and a 61 watt power adapter respectively. But the 96 watt adapter for the 14 inch is included when paying a $20 premium or when opting for the 10 core M1 Pro. So look, in my opinion, the $1200 premium is not worth it. I'd even say that most programmers should stick with the Air especially if you're leaning more towards web development. As for the average consumer, guys don't even bother because even with the pluggable docking station, you can still achieve a dual monitor setup. I would say that your money would be better spent somewhere else if you need the power. For $1200, you can definitely build a nice custom PC to fulfill the rest of your needs. I hope this video helps you guys choose the right laptop and I hope you all realize that the new MacBooks aren't meant to replace any of the MacBook 13 inch models. That being said, I need you all to smash that bell because next week we do have a full desk setup reveal. I will see you all soon, take care.